Okay, thank you all for joining me here. Uh, my name is Dan Shapir, and today I'll be talking about HTML5, the new application platform. Though I've been told I should probably have called it HTML5, the new app platform. I think that's the new term that everybody's using today. Um, in many ways, this presentation is going to be different from uh, the other presentations that you've seen uh, in at Bribe Forum. Uh, be First and foremost, because it really has nothing specifically to do with Windows. Uh, obviously, HTML5 does work on Windows and works very well, and there are a number of browsers that you can choose from. Uh, but it also works on other devices as well. In fact, that's the whole point of HTML5, is that it can run most uh, anywhere. Uh, in fact, I've recently uh, purchased uh, a new Samsung television for home, and it ha actually has an HTML5 capable browser built in. So that's an example. Uh, I know that somebody told me he has an HTML5 browser in his car, for example. So um, this is one big difference. The other difference uh, is, uh, some of you have seen this already, those who uh, arrived earlier, uh, so you please don't answer. Does everybody else know what this is? <coughs> So this is Gabe's favorite device. This is a Google Chromebook. Uh, I'm using it. I think I'm the first and probably the only Briform presenter to ever use a Google Chromebook. Uh, and uh, I actually had some problems with it because uh, it, it only connects to the internet uh, over wireless. And as you all know, the wireless here in the hotel isn't exactly great. Hopefully, I'll have the wireless connection, connection throughout the presentation. Otherwise, I'll run into problems with at least some of the demos. Um, the reason I'm using a Google Chromebook is uh, because Google Chromebook can only run HTML5 applications. You cannot install any native app on a Chromebook. Uh, that's the whole idea of it being just the browser. So, in f so and. This, by definition, means that all the demos that I'm going to show you through this presentation are all going to be HTML5. They cannot be native because, again, a Chromebook cannot run native applications. In fact, this presentation itself is an HTML5 application. This entire presentation, it's not PowerPoint. It's a one big HTML5 web page. So, and as you will see, it makes the presentation work kind of differently. OK, so again, this is who I am. I'm Dan Shapir. I'm a CTO and VP, oh, I left the VP part, VP R&D of Ericom Software. Uh, that means that I'm first and foremost a software developer. I, I deal with the development and creation of software products. So I'm not an IT professional, you can say. My forte is about developing software. And, do, and at Ericom, in the, uh, let's say, past two or three years, we've had a significant focus in developing applications for HTML5. Personally, I've been doing HTML5 related, or let's call it browser related development for a lot longer than that. I wrote my first, let's call it rich browser based application way back in something like 98 or 97. This is also, uh, I have a blog. You can find it by searching for Aircom Guy. I've also recently started tweeting. Uh, my handle is Dan Shapir, uh, but it's very new, so there's not much stuff there yet. So this is who I am. Uh, the stuff that we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about what HTML5 actually is. Uh, we're going to talk about how HTML5 came about. I personally am a bit of a history buff, so I really, the thing I like about that is that I like to understand how things came about and why they came about in the way that they came about. So I'm going to do a little bit about that for HTML5 as well. We're going to look at HTML5 features and capabilities. And to make it interesting, I've embedded a lot of cool demos in this presentation. In fact, one of the best things about HTML5 is that it's a great platform for doing cool demos. Again, a lot of these demos depend on internet access. So hopefully, I'll have internet access throughout the presentation. Otherwise, there will be no cool demos. Um, HTML, we'll talk about HTML5 versus native apps, and I'll give my personal perspective about when you should prefer which. 
Now, obviously, since it is my personal perspective, you can you know, accept it or reject it, but I try to base it on fact. And in fact, we as Ericom provide, create both HTML5 and native apps, so it's not as if I'm really trying to promote one on top of the other just because of you know, the company that I work for. Okay, so let's start with a cool demo. Uh, one of the things, let's wait for the demo to load, one of the things that uh, HTML5 was intended to, to do, to achieve, was to uh, uh, get, um, get away from the need to use plugins. And obviously the most common plugin that's used is Flash. And what is Flash, I think, mostly used for is for playing video. So it's not really surprising that uh, one of the first things that was done in the context of HTML5 was to add a video tag into the HTML syntax, which basically means that if you want to embed a video in a web page, you don't need to rely on any external plugin or add-on or, what, or whatever. You just put in that video tag and, that, and you know, that's it, like an image tag for those of you who are familiar with HTML. Now you can say, okay, so great, you know, I can do a video now, I can do it with you know, HTML, I don't need Flash, but you know, what's in it for me? And, and the answer is that beyond the fact that you, know, you don't need to, real, to rely on the existence of, of an external plugin, the fact that the video tag is part of the HTML means that it's accessible by other stuff running within the context of the, of the browser. For example, JavaScript. So JavaScript can interact with a video tag like it can interact with every other tag. And you can do very cool stuff because then you get this API and you can grab information from one thing and put it into another so you can do stuff like this. And in fact, what's happening in this particular demo is they're in fact grabbing frames from the video and rendering them onto a canvas tag, which is another new HTML5 tag, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And because a canvas tag supports freeform drawing, you can do a lot of these effects of grabbing the frame, breaking it up, putting it back together, and stuff like that, which would have been a lot more difficult or maybe even impossible without this capability. Okay, so what is an HTML5 web application? So, okay, so HTML5 web application is about the power of the cloud plus native app richness. That together is an HTML5 web app. Now obviously, and I think Ryan uh, wrote about it in the blog that a couple of months ago, uh, you don't have to use an HTML5 web application in order to leverage the power of the cloud. I mean, for example, you have native apps like Dropbox or iTunes that are all uh, in connected to the cloud, getting information out of the cloud, putting information back into the cloud, and they're native apps. But in the same way that it's so beneficial uh, to put the data in the cloud. It's also of great value to put the app itself in the cloud alongside the data because that means that uh, in the same way that you can get your, at your data from everywhere, you can get at your app from everywhere. And likewise, for the vendor, uh, he can add capabilities and new functionality into the app without having to think about how to distribute, to push down new versions of the app to the endpoints and to think about, wait a minute, I have these capabilities on this endpoint and other capabilities on other endpoints. Well, with a, with a browser-based app, because it's coming down from the cloud, it's delivered on demand, and because it, it's running on top of the browser platform, it basically just works everywhere. But the key point here, though, is that you want to have this native app richness. So what is native app richness? Uh, from my perspective, that means that the application has to be immersive. I mean, we expect certain things 
from modern native applications. I'm not talking about something like Notepad. I'm talking about the cool new uh, apps that we have today and are making their way into organizations thanks to the consumerization of IT. So we're talking about stuff like animations, uh, transitions and effects, uh, videos, audio capabilities, 3D graphics, and so forth. Um, so it has to be responsive. I mean, you know, uh, www, people used to refer to it as a worldwide wait. Well, these days, people want everything to be responsive, to be instantaneous. You want to be able to click something and it responds immediately. You don't want to wait to see an hourglass or something spinning while it's retrieving additional data. Uh, you want it to be interactive. You know, we have these various devices today with various interaction capabilities, uh, tablets, so we want it to be uh, able to interact with the application using multi-touch. We want it to be uh, um, aware of orientation so that if you flip your device over, uh, the screen adjusts accordingly. You may want it to have voice input or uh, vibration capabilities and so forth. Uh, you want to have more a native look and behavior. I don't mean just native look and feel, and not even necessarily exactly native, but I do mean that in terms of how you interact with this application and how it responds to certain actions that you perform, uh, you want it to behave like a native application. So that means, for example, that I want to be able uh, let's say I want to uh, make the application, have it the ha give it the ability to upload files back into the cloud. So I would like it to support drag and drop. I would like it to be able to <coughs> grab a file from, let's say, Windows Explorer, drag it into the browser window, and have that initiate the file upload, for example. Or uh, I saw uh, um, a media player implemented in HTML5 where you can, you can start playing back audio files by again just dragging them into the browser window and that's the type of interaction that we expect to see in native applications but we did not expect to see in browser based applications. We would like to have offline support. Uh, it's great that you can work, do all this fun stuff with HTML5 applications when you're online but uh, I was really worried before this presentation. I was like I had Gabe up here because I couldn't go online because this entire presentation, as I said, is, an H is a web page. This web page is actually coming off of our Ericom website. It's not here. And if I could not go online, then I would have problem, a problem accessing this presentation. And likewise, as I said, a lot of these demos are actually coming from wherever, and I would not be able to access them. Now, that's, uh, that might be acceptable for me here. But say you want to use your uh, email application while you're flying and you don't have internet access. Uh, that's something that unless HTML5 applications are able to do that, people will continue to use native applications instead. Uh, and you want to leverage device capabilities. So you want to have stuff like geolocation, audio and video chat may be built into the application. Um, so HTML5 web applications are first and foremost, oh yeah, that's a, about the client. What I mean by that? You know, when we're talking about web applications, we have the, the server side, which is generating or providing the HTML uh, and additional resources that are downloaded to the client over HTTP or HTTPS. And then we have the browser on the client side that's handling this information and in fact run, functioning as the platform on which everything is running rendering the HTML, processing the JavaScript, etc. Well, the thing to understand is that when we're talking about most of this HTML5 stuff, it's about what the browser does. Uh, the HTML spec doesn't really care about how the HTML5 is generated on the back end. So it could be PHP, ASP.NET, JSP, the standard doesn't care. So it, it, it talks about some of the communication protocols, but how the stuff is happening or what's happening on the server side that's beyond the scope of HTML5. HTML5 is about the browser, really. Okay, I was going to show a demo, and I, uh, but I think I might skip it. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, with uh, the new U, uh, Yahoo Pipes application. It's uh, like this kind of 
nice app for constructing um, uh, feeds. I might show it later if I have some time, but I recommend that you look at it as an example of an HTML5 application. Basically, they, they kind of use a pipe mechanism where you connect uh, feeds together by drawing lines. And it's a nice example of a, of a user interface that you would not expect to see uh, in a, inside a browser. So I might get back to that if we have time. OK, so what are the benefits of an HTML5 web application? So first of all, there is no installation on the endpoints. I mean, as I said before, today, most every endpoint has a browser. And by using a pure HTML5 web application, everything will more or less just run everywhere without having to install anything. And as we all know, installing stuff on the endpoints, configuring that installation, uh, managing uh, updates and patches and whatnot is a huge hassle. So the fact that you don't need to install anything is a very significant benefit. Um, okay, that's just what I just said. So you don't have to uh, take into account stuff like rollbacks, upgrade, etc. Write once, run everywhere. Now this is not the first time that this has been said. For those of you who are, uh, let's say, have been in this field for a while, may you recall that it's been the same has been said about Java. I think that this time, uh, the industry is doing it better. So uh, as we will see, it's not 100% perfect, but it's much better than it's ever been. And it includes uh, support for lockdown devices. Because again, because there is no installation, uh, a browser on a lockdown device can download the HTML5 app and run it. So in fact, I've used HTML5 apps from uh, hotel stations or from my gym, they have this sort of a lockdown uh, uh, browser. Uh, I've used that for various type of, of HTML5 apps, including our own. Um, it's always up to date because, as I said before, the application is actually downloaded on demand from the web server. If you just put a new version on the web server, essentially, more or less, immediately, everybody gets it. Um, there are lots of platforms to choose from. Uh, on the back end, as I said before, you can implement it what, using whatever back end technology you prefer. And on the client side, well, uh, IE supports HTML5, at least IE10, IE9 kind of, uh, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, Opera, you know, you have so many choices. Uh, you don't have to deal with an app store. Now, this might be less of an issue for you guys, but it can be a very big uh, hassle for us software developers. Um, you know, aside from the fact that Apple takes the cut from any app that you put there that you want to get paid for, uh, there's a whole process of just certifying your, your application with, with, uh, with, let's say, with Apple. Uh, I've been told about a story about this guy who submitted an app uh, the app would not get accepted, and they would not tell him why. And af I don't know, even know how he found out, but it turns out that a font that he was using was actually not in the public domain. It was owned by somebody. So they wouldn't accept it because he did not have the rights to some of the fonts that he was using in the application. You know? And they wouldn't tell him why, though. He kind of had to figure it out himself. So you know, there are a lot of hassles with putting stuff in, in an app store. Uh, you don't know when it will get accepted. You, know, you don't know if it will get accepted. You can't put beta uh, software, for example, in the Apple App Store. So that's a big challenge if you want to have like a public beta or something. Uh, when you're writing something as an HTML5 app, you don't have to deal with that. Uh, and it's cool. I definitely think, as a well, it's cool to me. I guess, uh, you know, I'm being a developer. I, by definition, not very cool. but. Uh, it, to me, HTML5 applications are very cool. OK, so what don't you need when you're developing an HTML5 web application? Well, you don't need virtual desktops. And you don't need terminal services. And you don't need connection brokers. And you don't need application virtualization. And you don't need client hypervisors or layering. In fact, you would never need to go to Brightform again if you use HTML5 web applications. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so web applications provide the richness and power of native desktop applications without the headaches that are often associated with <coughs> native applications. So what is, after all this, so what is really HTML5? HTML5 is the first HTML standard to come with a logo. So that's feature number one. And as you can tell, the person who designed this logo saw way too many Superman movies. But uh, you will see this logo, uh, on a, they're really trying to push this logo and to push the whole HTML5 thing. So uh, websites that, or web apps that use HTML5 are encouraged to put this logo on them so that everybody knows, hey, this is a cool website. Um, in order to understand how HTML5 apps came about, we need to understand why they came about. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this person, Douglas Crawford. He's really one of the gods of web development. He does crazy stuff with JavaScript. Uh, he's the inventor of JSON, for any of you who are familiar with that uh, uh, protocol. Uh, so he wrote back in 2006 that the browser was not designed to be a general purpose application platform. Uh, and the reason he wrote that was because people were using it as an application platform. In fact, as I said before, I personally used it as an application platform uh, almost 10 years before he said that. Now, the problem was, the reason he said it and, and what he meant by it is that the browser was just not functional enough. It wasn't stable enough. People would write a very sophisticated web apps, run them within the browser, and have the browser crash after 20 or 30 minutes because it ran out of memory. IE was notorious for having various resource leaks or memory leaks that would cause it to basically just eat up the entire system memory and crash if it was used with uh, web apps that were just too sophisticated in terms of what they were doing. So basically what the, the whole was that you, on the one hand you had people who were trying to do something while the infrastructure was not really designed to support it. So the first solution that people had was to use a kind of a band-aid which was to use browser plugins. Now plugins are essentially uh, external components made by third-party providers they're generally, not always, but often, they're uh, proprietary and closed source. Uh, you can think of them effectively as, let's say, DLLs, or later as XCs, that might be loaded by the browser, handed some content that was retrieved by the browser, and asked to render or handle that content independently of the browser itself. So the browser would effectively say, hey, you've got this region of the screen, you own it, you can render there whatever you want, and here are the parameters that will tell you what it is that the, the, you're supposed to be doing. Um, so let's look at the, at, the, at the plugins that everybody knows. So first were Java applets. Now they're effectively dead. I mean, nobody is creating new ones. And if you have, you know, unfortunate enough to still use a web app that's dependent on one, well, I pity you. Um, the reason they're effectively dead, I guess, is maybe because Microsoft wanted to kill them. Uh, whatever the reason may be, nobody's writing new Java applets anymore. Java is successful on the back-end side, but is non-existent, really effective, except maybe, well, outside the browser, on the client, it's, a, it's successful on the Android devices. But those are not Java applets. Those are Java, those are Android, Java apps, and that's something completely different. Browser-based Java applets are dead. Flash is dying. I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but Flash is dying. Uh, it started dying the day Apple decided not to include Flash support on, the I, on their iOS uh, devices in Safari on iOS. And it's been dying ever since to the point that Adobe even admits it now uh, and have said that they will not create new versions of mobile Flash anymore because it won't, it's not in iOS, it's still in Android, but will not be updated and will be dropped eventually, and it will not be in IE in Metro mode. Silverlight, stillborn. Uh, it's interesting that, uh, that while Microsoft tried to beat Adobe 
in their own game, HTML kind of came behind them and beat them both before Civilite even had a chance. Now, it was interesting. I don't know how many of you attended uh, Benny's, uh, and, uh, Benny's presentation on, uh, on uh, the various protocols, and he was using a Silverlight app to, to kind of play it. Uh, and we talked about it later, and he, like, they told me uh, the, how, uh, how there are many uh, you know, developers out there that are really annoyed about the fact that Microsoft was really promoting this platform and have now effectively dropped it. Uh, and are not promoting it anymore and are telling everybody, no, 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 we should be using HTML5. Uh, IE and ActiveX, that's the living dead. It just won't go away. Uh, so this is a very a morbid slide I think I created here. Um, you know, we all want to get rid of it. Hopefully, we eventually will succeed. Until, we, until then, we have companies like uh, what, uh, Browsium, right? That's what they're called. Uh, and or, the, or we can publish a browser off of a server, but really we just want this to go away. Um, so this is actually an interesting uh, comment or a, from a uh, quote from the Microsoft's own IE blog. It's a very uh, recommended blog for any of you who are interested in HTML5, uh, where they wrote that the transition to a plug-in free web is happening today. And that's another indication of how Microsoft themselves are dropping Silverlight. Uh, if you're using IE 10 on Windows 8, as you may know, it actually has these two modes. It can run in Metro mode, which, in which it's full screen using the, regular, the, the new Metro interface, or it can run in the desktop mode. In the desktop mode, IE still supports uh, plugins. In the Metro mode, no plugins. Uh, so for example, I was talking to the guy from Microsoft. Gabe, what's his name? I forget his name. Uh, the guy, the guy who was from Microsoft. Uh, the guy who's here. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, uh, you may have seen the the web interface, uh, the RD uh, web interface. Um, RD web interface will not work in Metro mode because RD web interface actually uses ActiveX to launch the ActiveX mechanism to launch uh, the RDP client, but in Metro mode, ActiveX doesn't work because it's plug-in free. So in Metro mode, you will need to use the Metro client, which displays the icons inside, uh, directly inside itself, rather than to use the, the web interface. Um, the, the real plug, the real solution for that hole that we were talking about before is this. This is a quote from the HTML5 working draft. By the way, that's an interesting thing about web standards. They're always in draft state. They are never finalized. It's, it's very interesting. It's always beta. It's always draft. It's never, it's never really, I don't know, never really released. I think the Google search engine, I think, is still beta. Um, so what they wrote is that the main area that has not been adequately addressed by HTML5, by HTML, is the vote subject referred to as web applications. This specification attempts to rectify it. And this just shows that the emphasis of HTML5 is on web applications. In fact, originally, the HTML5 was called Web Apps 1.0. Um, so, and then it became HTML5. So the, the real purpose, HTML5 is not just about web apps, but that's the focus. Uh, this is also a very interesting uh, quote. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. Uh, Steve Jobs wrote a public letter Called, titled Thoughts on Flash back in 2010, in which he really gave his views on, on where we were heading in the, with the web. And the quote that I would like to read is that Flash is no longer necessary to watch video or consume any kind of web content. New open standards created in the mobile era, such as HTML5, will win. And I hope that anybody who had Adobe stock sold it immediately when he saw this quote. Um, because if Steve Jobs was out to get you, you were dead. Okay, here is that HTML5 logo we saw before, but this time as a web app. What I mean by the fact that it's a web app, uh, first of all, we see that it's immersive. You have this animation, it's spinning around, it's also interactive. I can go to these bars here and I can drag them. And as you can see, I can control 
what's going on. I see it's kind of flashing here. OK, that's HTML5 for you. Uh, and I can start it spinning again. And you can see the response was also immediate because everything is being done client side. This is all being done on the, on the client in using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. In fact, and I'll talk all about it more, uh, in fact, what we have here is effectively an image that uh, vers various CSS uh, uh, rules are applied to. I'll talk about exactly you know, what CSS is. Uh, and then JavaScript is actually being used to modify the CSS rules and in this way control how, how this thing is spinning. Okay. So, HTML5, it's the latest version of HTML. It's a common standard. So, it's endorsed by the W3C, which is the standard body for the web. It's an evolution, not a revolution. They did not take existing HTML, chuck it out the window, and replace it with something new. Rather, they added stuff. They didn't even change existing stuff because the, H because the web, and, and, and in particular, HTML is all about retaining backward compatibility. If it worked once, it has to work. In fact, it's gotten to the point that if, let's say, Netscape had a bug and people became reliant on this bug and enough websites use it, that bug effectively becomes a part of the standard. So it, it, they really didn't throw anything out. It's completely backward compatible with older browsers. Older browsers will not be able to take advantage of the new features, but they will not crash and burn when a site that uses, them, uses a new HTML5 capabilities is downloaded. Basically, they may just not render the content. So if you have a new video, you have the video tag, and it's a browser that doesn't understand the video tag, well, you just won't get the video. But the rest of the page will render uh, as expected. It's still evolving. Uh, in fact, this is another thing I, I, I talked about with Brian when he visited us a while ago. I told him that developing for HTML5 is like getting a new version of Windows every month. Because basically, they add stuff at an amazing rate. Every day there's a new feature, there's a new capability. So it's really exciting and it's really enjoyable, at least for me, because I like to learn new stuff. But it also means that if you're kind of uh, out of the loop for a bit, then you're left behind. Uh, you really have to keep up on your toes to keep up with HTML5. Uh, it eliminates, we talked about this before, uh, it's, prom it's promoted by all the leading companies in software today, M uh, uh, Apple, Microsoft, Google, the Mozilla F Foundation, Opera are all behind it, all are pushing it forward. Uh, it's moving forward step by step. It's not as if there's a committee behind some closed doors and they're talking about it and three years from now they will, they will release it. It's not, the water, it's not the waterfall type of thing. It's, it's continuous. So it's not like Windows. You know, we're hearing about Windows 8 and then we get in Windows 8 beta and then we can finally see what it is. That's not the case. They're, they're constantly enhancing the, the browsers. They're adding new features. So you, like almost every, every couple of days, I get a new version of Chrome and it adds a few additional HTML5 capabilities that did not exist in the previous version. Uh, and each browser, and that's a bit something that's a bit unfortunate, is that each browser is taking a somewhat different route. Uh, a lot of the features that are being added to HTML5 are proposed by different vendors. And as a result, uh, they first add the features that they like into their browsers and then you know you have different features in different browsers and that makes life a little bit more difficult. The building blocks uh, are, are HTML5 itself which includes new tags, new attributes, new attributes values, uh, CSS3 uh, which has CSS, okay we'll see in a minute what that means, but it has new selectors, modifiers, actions, filters, effects, and Oh, and that's key. Eight, the modern browsers, everything essentially they do, most of them, is, eight, is GPU accelerated, which means that they are killer fast. Uh, really, it's, it's amazing how fast they can do graphics and animations, 3D, whatnot, even on low-end hardware. 
Uh, this GPU acceleration is also very important on mobile devices because it means that everything is very friendly in terms of battery use. Because, for example, if I want to do animation, rather than running some sort of a loop uh, in, in code, I can use uh, uh, GPU instructions to achieve similar effects. And there is the JavaScript itself, which is kind of the programming language of the web, and it has new APIs and is much, much, much faster. Uh, here's an example of what I mean by all this. So uh, everything here, the, the HTML is on the outside. HTML is all these tags that we know and love. You know, the, the, oh, the uh, uh, open bracket, the closed bracket, uh, those tags. Some cases you have attributes like ID equals something. I'm guessing most of you are more or less either somewhat familiar with HTML, or at least have seen it. Uh, this is CSS, in this case embedded directly inside the file. It's usually actually recommended to have it as separate files and reference those files via URLs. Basically what this says is that buttons in this page should have a text color that's white and a background color that's blue. And that's kind of the different role of CSS versus HTML. HTML basically specifies the elements, specifies what it is that you're saying. Uh, the style sheet, you can think of them as a skin. It basically determines how things are rendered, you know, uh, which fonts do you use, which colors. And again, because you can reference them as external files, it means that if you want to change the whole look of a website without changing the content, it's very easy. You just replace uh, the style sheet. And finally, we have the JavaScript. JavaScript adds the uh, interactivity aspect of, of, the, of the web. Uh, in this case, I'm uh, look, use, using this function, which is called getElementById, to find this button based on its ID value. And I assign a function to its onClick event handler. In JavaScript, everything is event-driven. You basically attach functions to events and have these functions execute when the events occur. So in this case, the event is when the user clicks on the button. And what it does is just pops up a, a, a dialog box saying clicked. So, and again, JavaScript is also re usually recommended that it reside in external files and referenced. So JavaScript can react to events. JavaScript can modify the HTML. So for example, you can have, uh, you know, when a user clicks, uh, you know, uh, something and you can reorder content on the page without going back to the server and getting, and, and getting a new version of the page just by having the JavaScript on the client side actually access the HTML and modify it and the browser automatically just re-renders the modified HTML. Uh, I was talking before about JavaScript speed. This is interesting. Uh, when Chrome came out about three years ago, it was already probably the, f I think it was at that time, had more or less the fastest JavaScript implementation. Yet, as you can see, uh, JavaScript has become progressively faster in Chrome during those past three years to the extent that uh, I ran this test and it turns out that the Chrome that I had when I ran this test, which is Chrome version 19, is five times faster than what, in terms of JavaScript execution speed, than what Chrome initially was. So think about it. JavaScript has become five times faster in Chrome in a period of three years. The big jump, by the way, occurred around Chrome 10 when they introduced a new JavaScript optimizer called Crankshaft, which is just crazy. This is, this is a topic that's worth a whole presentation just by itself. Um, it's gotten to the point where JavaScript in certain situations can be as fast or almost as fast as compiled C++ code. It's really crazy. It's amazing. Uh, HTML functionality areas. So interestingly, not only did they give a logo to the HTML itself, they also gave, this is kind of small, so I'm guessing the people behind can see it, but they actually gave different logos to the various functionality areas of HTML5. Somebody really liked logos there. Um, so uh, you're talking about connectivity. We'll talk about that. WebSocket, server-side events, styling, uh, that's effects, transitions, animations, device access, stuff like geolocation. Uh, 3D graphics, you have several options there. We will talk about them. Multimedia, audio and video, we already saw video example. Uh, performance and integration. 
Uh, we saw how JavaScript performance has improved. Uh, there's also something called web workers, for example, which are effectively uh, uh, a mechanism of creating multi-threaded browser-based application, something that you, you couldn't do before. Uh, semantics, you've got richer tags. That means you, you're, you can say what you mean. You can actually say this thing is a title, this thing is a footer, this thing is a header inside the HTML. Offline and storage, which means you can store content uh, uh, um, persistently in the client device. Uh, we'll t let's see if we can get, we'll have time to talk about that, I'm not sure. Um, okay, here are those same logos, this time is a spinning cube, uh, again, done using uh, HTML5 capabilities. This is not a movie. This is being rendered in real time on the brow in the browser using a GPU, using the browser's own GPU. Now, I don't know if you know this, but the Chromebook has really dinky hardware. Again, this is something that Brian Madden wrote about. This thing costs 300 bucks and runs for 10 hours on a battery charge. So obviously, uh, the, the hardware there is fairly low end and consumes, uh, well, not a lot of power. So the only way to achieve something like that with good performance is to really effectively leverage the, the GPU. And, and really what's going on here is they just download, I just downloaded the six images and then I'm applying 3D CSS transformations to them and having these transformations being updated over time. Here's another example of, uh, so we, we saw like really like high-end capabilities of 3D animations. Let's go lower level. Let's look at some of the uh, lower level capabilities. By, by the way, I'm kind of, I forgot to start my time. So how much time has, has gone yeah, by? An Half an hour? Okay, that's great. Um, okay, so um, some lower level capabilities. So uh, we've all, you know, anybody who's written any HTML application has usually created a form. And one of the things that you often have in forms is you want the user to provide, let's say, an email address. And in the past, you would do that by specifying a text field, uh, a general purpose text field, and then the user would just fill in, but have a label that says email, and then the user would know that they need to provide an email. Well, now you can actually specify that the type of, of the field is email. Uh, and we'll see in a second what it means. You can also put in a placeholder, which basically specifies the text here inside the field. You can say that the field is required, which means that the user has to fill in a value before you can submit the form, uh, that it will receive uh, the focus immediately when the page is loaded. Now, any one of you familiar with HTML5, will, with the HTML and browser development and JavaScript will say, hey, well, you know, I could have done this stuff for years with a wide variety of, of uh, JavaScript libraries. If I wanted to have form validation, there are a million JavaScript libraries that do form validation. But the advantage here is that by putting this information directly in the tag, uh, it makes everything much, more, much simpler. The whole thing about HTML is that it's, it's, it's uh, attribute-based programming. You say what you mean. So you, you don't want to program stuff to just to validate something. You basically just want to say this is an email address and have it function appropriately. Also, the fact that you don't have to rely on external libraries uh, to make sure you're getting the right version, to avoid library version conflicts. Libraries can become very large, so they can be slow to download, etc. This way, everything is just so small and simple. And again, going back to that backward compatibility issue that we talked about, older browsers, that when they see a type that they don't recognize, they just treat it as text. So if I load this on an old browser, well, it won't do the validation, but it will still work. Okay? So what does it mean uh, that it's email type? It means that, first of all, if I try to submit without clicking, putting in a value, I get this message because I specified that it's required. And this is done automatically by the browser itself, no JavaScript required. Likewise, if I s type something that is not a valid email and click submit, I'll also get an error message. Only if I type something that is actually a real email address will it work. And I won't do it because I forget what happens if I click submit here. <coughs> it might break, so I, I'll, I'll skip that. But 
there is actually another advantage, something that you wouldn't get from a library. Uh, if you're using this on a tablet and the email and the type is email, when the virtual keyboard opens up, you'll actually have the at button in the keyboard. With regular text uh, fields, you don't have the at button. You have to switch to the alternate keyboard. And here, because it's specified as an email, the browser is smart enough to bring up an appropriate uh, keyboard. And that's not something that you'd be able to achieve with a JavaScript library. There are other field types as well. A URL kind of works the same, just instead of validating what you're typing as an email address, it validates that it looks like, it looks like a, a URL. It obviously doesn't valid, validate that it's actually a valid URL. Just make sure that it looks like a URL. Uh, number, in addition to being able to type, I can also use these small buttons here to increment. I have a range thingy. Now again, Range controls have been available for years as part of JavaScript input libraries, but now there's actually just an input with a type equals range, I think, and you get the range. So it makes life a whole lot easier. Uh, and finally, let's, I don't know if it will work or not. I've had some problems with this in the, in the past, but there's speech input. So I can so click here, hello, worked. So that's cool, I think. So you can, you know, if you're looking at like the Google search these days and you can see that they sometimes have the speech, that's what they do. You just add the speech attribute into the input field and speech works. No programming. Um, here's an, a different example. So we were looking at controls and how uh, HTML5 enhances existing controls. But what if I want to do something that it's more kind of out there? We talked about, uh, you know, a native application experience, and native applications support drag and drop. So let's say I want to do some drag and drop related functionality uh, in the context of, of my web application. So with HTML5, there are now drag and drop events for elements in the web page which means it's very easy to do something like, if I can control this thing, like this, and drop it something into the, the can. Let's uh, take another one. Oh, it's gone. Uh, and again, I, I, well, you know what? We may look at the source later, but it's very, very simple to do this sort of stuff in HTML5. Some of this stuff you could do with older versions of HTML, but you had to use uh, libraries like jQuery. You had to write a lot of uh, boilerplate code in order to achieve it. Very easy to do with HTML5. Wait a minute. Okay. Okay, the cool tool. Um, I don't know if you know this. Modern browsers, essentially almost all of them, have a built-in development environment inside of them, a really sophisticated, feature-rich, and complex development environment built into the browser. The reason you have to have a development, if you're looking at a platform as a platform for developing applications, we as developers know that you have to have a sophisticated development environment built into that because we spend approximately 90% of our time debugging. That's what we do. And you need to have tools to effectively debug. Otherwise, you're just stuck with doing message boxes and stuff like that, and life really sucks. So having a, a powerful development tool, a development environment, makes all the difference in the world. And the amazing thing is that all the browsers develop, browser developers, that's Chrome, that's Google, and Apple, and all of them have built these amazing development environments into each and every browser copy. Your browser on your device has a built-in development environment, with one slight exception. Uh, well, actually, two exceptions. Exceptions are that these development environments don't exist on mobile devices. The mobile devices just don't have enough resources, but they're introducing an interesting ways of, of 
uh, doing debugging on mobile platforms as well. And with Firefox, you actually have to install the extension uh, called Firebug before you get it. So it's not on by default. But other than that, it's just everywhere. What do they, so the developer tools there, there there's the Chrome DevTools, uh, Mozilla Firebug, as I said, it's an extension, Safari Web Inspector, Opera Dragonfly, IE has one which is really nice, which is called F12 because that's the button you click in order to launch it. And it's called the F12 Developer Tools. Uh, and it's, as I said, it's not available, but you can sometimes do remote debugging. Uh, one of the cool features in the Chrome beta on Android is that you can actually hook it up with uh, a desktop and then use uh, Chrome developer dev tools in your desktop browser to do remote debugging for your browser on the Android uh, device. Uh, the easiest way to open them is, in some cases, it's to right click on anything in the web page and you get the option called uh, inspect element. We'll see that in a minute. Another option is to click F12.
page like the script files or the images uh, or cookies that, uh, that are being used. So uh, this page is coming from our website, so we can see that our website pushed down various cookies when this uh, thing was downloaded. Uh, network. Uh, okay, I don't have any network traffic now, but you, but it, so I'll skip that. Scripts. As I said, there's an actual script debugger here, and I see that there's a script error here, which is nice. I can look at the various script files. And I could uh, place, oh, this is a minified script file, which means that, oh, this is an interesting thing. One of the things about JavaScript, and we'll talk more about this when we get to native versus web apps, is that JavaScript is always delivered in source for code form, which can be a bit of an issue for companies that want to kind of preserve their intellectual property because essentially everybody can look at their source code. Well, one of the things that, uh, that you know, we do is to do something called minify and obfuscate the JavaScript. So it has to be in source form, but we run it through a tool that basically removes all the spaces, replaces variable names with obscure letter combinations, and makes the thing just, has two advantages. It makes it di more difficult to read, and it also reduces the size so the download is smaller and therefore faster. Uh, but now you have something like this as part of the tool where I can click this and suddenly it's much more readable. So there goes my obfuscation. Uh, more, well, not completely. The comments are gone. But, uh, and the variable names are still not quite what they used to be, but it's much, much more readable. So in fact, you know, we're back to the situation where anybody can effectively uh, read your source code, which is interesting. Uh, timeline, that actually shows me pages activity as it's being loaded. You know what? Um, let's see something interesting. Let's close this here. Let's go out of full screen. It's interesting. I'm develop delivering this presentation on my knees. So let's go, uh, let's see if I still have internet access. Let's go to brianmadden.com. And let's open the developer tools again. Oh, shit, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be interesting. Uh, so let's do inspect element. So again, one of the interesting tabs here is called audits, which show you what Google think about how efficient your web page is and what could be improved in your web page. So let's run this audit. Why it's isn't bad. it? I'll blame the developers and it's very awesome I do. I just yeah, first of all I I need to be able to click this thing though. It doesn't want me to click it. That's interesting. Isn't that kind of Yeah. Okay, so we got the results. If I can click the results. By the way, this development environment is an HTML5 web app. This entire development environment is implemented in JavaScript, in HTML, and style sheets. So that's pretty amazing as well. Assuming when it works. And I can't click the results. Uh, eventually. It will, I think I'm, I'm using this device beyond its intended uh, limits. Okay, here it is. Okay, so uh, red shows things it really doesn't like, and yellow says, shows things that it kind of doesn't like. So, for example, it says that you're using nine CSS files, which means that uh, the browser has to go back to the server uh, Jack, Jack, you can get this information yourself. You know, you don't have to take a picture. I'll, I'll email it to you. Um, so, for example, it says, you know, if you combined your files into one, then the browser would only need to download that one file, 
which would make the download faster, which would reduce the load on the web server. Likewise, you have 17 JavaScript files which are referenced by this page. So again, why don't you combine them into one JavaScript, large JavaScript file and have it both download faster and less load and so forth. Gzip compression. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but one of the features in, HT, in HTTP 1.1, I think, is that you can actually have the web server gzip stuff before it's downloaded to the client and the browsers have built-in gzip decompression so they basically just decompress the stuff before uh, using it. So you can uh, enable that, IAS has it for example. Uh, the downside is it more load on the web server because it has to do this gzip on the fly whenever con content is requested but again download is faster because uh, uh, content is compressed. Uh, you're not leveraging browser caching enough, which means you're not properly setting uh, expiration dates on various resources that you're using. Uh, obviously, the more caching that you do, the better, because again, you don't need to retrieve the data over and over and over again. Uh, you can leverage proxy caching better. You should minimize your cookie sizes, because apparently you have lots and lots and lots of cookies. Uh, serves, uh, you know, and they go beyond that because they, you know, let's see another one, web page performance, optima, oh, turns out that if you would reorder uh, your script references and, and style sheet references, your page will work faster, apparently. It has to do, it has to do, it has to do with the fact that the, the browser starts rendering the screen while it's still downloading the stuff from, from a web server. Now, what happens if it runs into something that may change how it needs to render the rest of the page? Uh, so there are two options there for the browser. One is to basically just stop, wait for the resource to download, and, and only then continuing the rendering, which, is what, which would make rendering a bit slower. Another option, which is one I think that Firefox does, but uh, 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 Chrome actually doesn't, is they do s uh, speculative rendering. They render based on what they assume will happen, and then if it turns out that they were wrong, they basically discard what they've done and go back and re-render that part again. You know, so browsers do some crazy shit to be really fast. It's amazing some of the stuff that they do. Uh, your site actually continues to send information up all the time as I recall. So if I go back to the network tab, I can see that there's a lot of network activity going on. I'm not sure what it is. I, I didn't try to research it. It may have to do with the banner ads. I have no idea. Um, another interesting thing is to look at the timeline. Uh, you know what? Let's do look at the network while Network or whatever, what we, we reload. This is fun. It's fun because it's not my website. It's for you. Yeah. Our timeline. By the way, Gabe, I have to tell you that my biggest complaint about BrianMadden.com is that you are not mobile friendly. Uh, that's our biggest complaint as well. Um, it just takes time and money. Yeah. Isn't that the, always the case? Okay, I didn't turn it on. Never mind. Okay, I think we all got the point. So there's this amazing development environment built in. It's, it's, use, uh, it's useful for, uh, obviously, for developers, but it's also useful for people who just manage and maintain their, their websites because you can get a lot of information from that. Okay, going back to the presentation. Okay, graphics. HTML, I have 10 minutes? Oh, that, okay, half the presentation is not going to be presented, but that's okay. Uh, HTML has lots of graphics options. Let's run through this. Vector graphics, raster graphics, 3D graphics. We saw some demos, videos, transitions, animations, effects. Uh, here's a nice example of, of 2D graphics vector, uh, called vector graphics. I can uh, call something called SVG. Uh, useful for creating stuff like diagrams or images that look great in whatever screen res. I should be able to move it, but I can't, so never mind. Okay, Canvas. C 
Canvas is like the star of HTML5. It's a free form 2D drawing surface uh, you can use, uh, that you can draw on using JavaScript instructions. You have a full 2D API for doing the 2D graphics. Uh, drawing can be reused, so you can do any, you can reuse it, so you can draw something, erase it, and then draw again, creating animations. All the games that you're now seeing, the HTML5 games, all of them are effectively using Canvas. Here's a cool demo, uh, if it works, if we have internet access. This is live. This is not a video, this is live. So this is in effect using Canvas to draw a remote desktop, and it's interactive. This is not an ActiveX control embedded in the web page. This is an HTML tag. This is a Canvas tag with JavaScript rendering a remote desktop into the local browser. Okay? And it's fully interactive. But I'm running out of time, so let's... WebGL. WebGL is not a super cool thing. You know what OpenGL is? OpenGL is a standard for a library or API for doing 3D graphics. So, modern web browsers now support a subset of this library called WebGL. WebGL is a JavaScript API for uh, rendering interactive 3D graphics. Uh, it, it includes, it uses shader code that's executed by the CPU, GPU, sorry, so it's all GPU accelerated. In fact, bo both, the canvas is, ex is GPU accelerated for both 2D and 3D. Uh, it's based on OpenGL, uh, or actually something called OpenGL ES. That's not my area of speciality. I'm not really familiar with all the various 3D libraries. Uh, it also uses, like the, the canvas that we saw before, but this time it's using the same canvas service, but this time for 3D uh, rendering. Here's an example, assuming it loads. It's a simulation of Quake. So I won't actually be able to fire, uh, but I should be able to move around. Let's see, it takes a little bit time to load. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that's been driving HTML5, and I think the same can be said about many platforms that we use today, is games. There basically is the concept of if we make this platform good enough for games, then anything else can also work. So with uh, WebGL, uh, here, this is not, again, this is not a, 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 a picture. This is all being rendered in real time using this dinky device's GPU, and I can actually do stuff like this, and I can actually move around more or less, okay? This is done, this is a web app. This is JavaScript, okay? Canvas? Yeah. This is, this is Canvas inside. So it's Canvas with, with the 3D rendering instructions. Uh, you can't hear the audio because I didn't connect the audio, but yes, you get audio. Uh, although there is a certain problem, Apple in their infinite wisdom have decided that they don't want audio to automatically pay, play on the iPad. So on iPad, you can only, uh, a user has to click on a play button or something to, to start an audio. You can't have JavaScript automatically starting audio in the background. Yes? Yes. Well, it's GPU, it's GPU accelerated. The question was about hardware uh, requirements. So the answer is, uh, it, it's, not a, it, it's GPU accelerated. So if you have uh, the, the appropriate hardware, it's much better. Uh, Google, for example, just uh, licensed a shader, a high-end shader library from uh, a company that creates tool for companies that develop games. So in case they don't find a GPU, they actually uh, emulate a GPU and get the, the best performance that they can. And obviously your performance will vary based on the device, the capabilities of the device that you're using, okay? so. Uh, audio and video, we talked about the video tag. There's the audio tag, support for the sta standard uh, formats, 
uh, MP3s, Og Vorbis, okay. Uh, it's everything scriptable. We saw an example of that. Uh, let's start running forward because I do want to talk a little bit about, so there's WebSockets as a new communication protocol. I come to that if I have a minute or two left. Uh, Client-side storage, I feared that I wouldn't have time to cover this. They built an SQL database into the browser and then they decided that it's not the way to go. So now the way to go is something called IndexedDB which is an sort of, you can think about it as an object-oriented database. But the key idea here is that you effectively have a way to persist large amounts of information on the client side. Uh, there are various values to that. First, you know, working offline. Uh, if you uh, uh, think about an email client, the email client at the end of the day is a bit like a local database that synchronizes with an online database. And now you can write an, a browser-based email client that works j in just that way. And the benefit is that first it can work offline because if it can't connect, it can use a local uh, database. And second, it can reduce uh, 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 overhead and improve performance because it can do, you, you work with a local database and then occasionally sync it back up to the uh, online database. Um, I'll skip that. Uh, additional proposed uh, device APIs sync with contacts, syncs with calendar, get the battery status of the device so that you can do less graphics intensive stuff if there's not enough battery, uh, initiate vibrations, uh, network information so you can get some indication about the network speed that you have, uh, sensors that's really way out there, uh, connecting it to the game pads. Um, okay, this is another interesting thing. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay, so with IE, whenever a new version came out, it was just like adding another layer on a cake. You know, you were stuck with all the old users using older versions of IE, which meant that you had to continue to support these versions effectively forever. Now what's happening with the new browsers, because the browsers, all these new browsers have a self-update mechanism, effectively all the users of these new browsers are always using the latest and greatest version of the browser. <coughs> so you can see very quickly after a browser, new browser version is released, it uh, effectively replaces almost every previous version of the browser that was out there, which means that I as a developer can target uh, the latest version and take advantage of the new features as they become available. And I don't have to worry so much like I used to about older versions. And Microsoft is kind of adopting the same thing with IE10. As I understand it, IE10 will also have this sort of an update mechanism built in. Uh, the downsides of HTML5. Recruiting developers, recruiting developers can be difficult because for two reasons. First of all, it's a hot field, so there's a lot of demand. And second, uh, the, it used to be that the web stuff was for web designers and developers did, you know, heavy lifting stuff like C++ or Java. So you now you have to find developers that can speak the language of the web and that can be more difficult. Uh, the standard is very much a work in progress. It's evolving, things are changing, standards are adopted and then they are dropped. WebSQL is a good example. Uh, they, they, Google really pushed it and then the W3C decided, hey, we're not, we're not going to go this way, so you should replace everything you've done with WebSQL with IndexedDB. Uh, cross browser compatibility is still a chore. Even though everybody's <laughs> trying to adhere to the standard, the reality is that it's still much more difficult than it, you know, it should be or can be to create cross browser uh, uh, stuff, especially if you also want to support old IEs. Offline support, they failed there, kind of. Offline support, there is something there, but it's really not as good as it should be. And they're kind of rethinking this whole thing. Mobile browsers are still very much lacking in functionality compared to desktop browsers. Uh, building applications UIs is more complicated than it should be. So it's like, it's easy to create this super cool games with 3D and you can create those simple forms very easily. But say you want to put like a splitter bar or something in the middle, well that, or a menu, that's suddenly a big challenge. Uh, so it, it it's, it's, turns out that you know doing stuff like pull down menus, it's much more difficult than it should be when you're creating an HTML5 web app. Um, 
Backward compatibility is paramount. That's both good and a bad thing. Obviously, an environment cannot succeed if it doesn't have backward compatibility. But on the other hand, it means that sometimes you know something is bad, but you can't fix it. When is a native app preferable? So last two slides. So when is a native app preferable? When you're targeting only one platform. Uh, that's, although that's kind of a stupid reason. I mean, everybody hopes to succeed and success these days meaning that means that people will use you on more than one platform. But if you know for sure that this will only run on that platform, by all means, use the native uh, app for that platform. Uh, if you need a very app-specific look and feel, if you want an app that on the iPad looks 100% like an iPad app, and you're willing to pay to have you know, the app have the native look and feel on every platform, then create it as native app for every platform because creating an exact native UI using HTML5 is possible, but it's much more difficult than just doing it using a native app. Uh, maximum performance. Uh, if you need to squeeze absolutely the most performance that you can out of the platform, then you should do it as a native. But I have to tell you that with all the GPU acceleration and everything going on, it's getting to the point where the browsers are really, really close. Uh, offline, I said offline is kind of sketchy, so if offline is super critical for you, you probably need to do it as a native app still. Hopefully this will be fixed in the future. And if you, again, this is probably something that will never be fixed. I mean, if you need access to, like, I, I don't know, like a point and sale system, point of sale system that's connected via USB or something, that's not something that an HTML5 application will be able to do. Or if you need complete access to the local file system, that's not something that an HTML5 app will be able to do. Uh, if, you don't, if you want to be in the App Store, because you want people to purchase your app through the App Store, then you have to be a native app. Uh, and if, the client, if you don't want people to be able to do view source on your client-side code, then you should be a native app. When, should, when is an HTML5 app preferable? In my opinion, all the other time. What I mean by that, really, is that your outlook should be I should develop it as a, nat as a HTML5 app, and then you have to convince me why I shouldn't. The default, in my opinion, should be HTML5 these days, certainly going forward. Uh, some resources that uh, you, can, you will be able to find. Dive into HTML5 is a great overview of HTML5, very readable, very amusing, lots of cool demos. HTML Rocks is a super website maintained by Google that has lots of articles, lots of demos, lots of slideshows. Uh, the Mozilla Developer Network, uh, I, the Microsoft I blog I mentioned before. If you go into YouTube and search for HTML5 or JavaScript, ton of, of great videos there about that. Channel 9 is the Microsoft uh, video site that I hope you're all familiar with. Also has a lot of videos about that. Stack Overflow is just a website that has a lot of questions and answers style content. A lot of information about that, about everything. Another very, very recommended website. Um, so HTML5, the future of the web. Thank you. <laughs>